Jimmy Lynam's with us here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. And, uh, Coach, uh, welcome to the show. And, you know, last night, uh, 372 and 0, the Knicks were in that situation. The Sixers, meanwhile, had lost 78 straight times when they were down by 15 or more. Uh, so, kind of a symbolism there of one team moving in one direction and another team moving in the opposite direction. And we saw that kind of on display last night. Yeah, those numbers, uh, Mike, are uh, pretty overpowering. I guess uh, you could also make the point, you know, it's eventually the, those type things happen, you know, on both sides. But I think maybe uh, as it pertains to the Sixers, it uh, it's kind of a sign of things to come. You know, it helps them sustain this momentum that they brought into the new year, uh, that they, this team, meaning the 16-17 version of the Sixers, has improved and is playing much better. That's a definite. And that this year's team is a much improved version of previous seasons is also very evident. Uh, many people, I guess, would on, the onlookers would just point to Embiid as the one reason. But are there other factors as to why this team has taken, you know, I guess you could say pretty big steps considering they have more wins already than they uh, accumulated all of last year? Well, it certainly starts with Embiid. Uh, you know, when you have a player of uh, of his caliber, I mean, granted, very young, very inexperienced still, but this guy's uh, just his gifts uh, physically that he brings to the game, along with his technique. When you, I've always defined the super, I mean, those special, and it's a small list, in my opinion, of super players that can really dictate the outcome of games on a consistent basis. It's a marriage of incredible physical talent along with great skill. And Embiid certainly qualifies, uh, you know, in both categories. I know it's really early, but, uh, you know, you were around Charles Barkley a lot, you know, and that kind of personality, you know, it's it's very early in terms of about where he's going to be, but just the personality and the way he embraces, it seems like wanting the ball, uh, you know, all of that stuff, those kind of things all factor into guys who become, you know, great players. No, no question. And that's, I, uh, in my opinion, that's uh, a head-on uh, comparison. You know, Charles had that, that it factor. He always had it. Uh, anytime, you know, they put a mic in front of him, you know, people automatically I said it's that old uh, E.F. Hutton. You know, when he speaks, they listen, and rightly so. And I think Embiid has – he has that intangible, and I think he can add to it. You know, when when Barkley speaks, sometimes you know he likes to tweak the media, but Barkley's a very, very bright and insightful person, and I see those same qualities in Embiid. Coach, can you break down that final play and uh, what TJ's role was in it and why it stands out? Yeah, it was an interesting thing, or uh, the way it evolved. What happens in a situation like that? I think it's fair to say that more often than not. Uh, the, the NBA team will call a timeout. Uh, and what actually takes place in the coach's mind, you know, probably if there's 20,000 people in that building watching that game, you know, 19,000 plus are watching the basketball. And what the coach of the Sixers, Brett Brown, in this uh, instance, the moment that the Sixers secure the ball, what the coach sees, it's like a freeze frame, a quick snapshot, and he sees 10 bodies. Uh, five white shirts, five, you know, dark shirts. And you have to make an instantaneous decision. Do you like the position of your guys with respect to them, knowing that your guys going to push the ball up the floor? So Brett took that quick snapshot, and, and his, his instinct, which proved to be correct, was let him go. And what you're essentially saying, that I, all we're trying to do is get a, a, a ball in the air before that buzzer goes off that has a reasonable chance of going in the basket. And I say he proved right, obviously, that great that it went in. But he was right in the fact that, yeah, they had a very good chance of getting a high percentage shot. So the way it unfolded, uh, TJ and Gerald Henderson, they kind of both pursued what was a like a little bit of a knocked ball. Uh, Porzingis shoots a shot with the shot clock on his back from the corner. And it's one of my old adages, you better make a corner jumper. Because if my team decides to run off your missed corner jumper, we're, we're going to have a chance of getting something in the open floor. It's a very bad defensive balance, shooting a corner jump shot. I know the, the world today loves the corner three. And my adage would be, I just add, yeah, better go in. Or we're, we're dang sure going to try to run off it. So Henderson gets the ball. 
and starts pushing it up the court. And Bede, as he's prone to do on virtually every possession, he's running like straight down the center of the court trying to get to the other rim as quickly as possible. And so doing, drawing defense as he runs because he's such a lethal weapon. And where you have to give McConnell tremendous credit, he would have been much more comfortable in the play had he had the ball. In terms of natural positions, McConnell with the ball, Gerald Henderson running a wing. But McConnell instinctively, because he's got a good basketball like sense and IQ, he got himself out onto the wing and got some spacing involved. So as Gerald pushed it up the court, he sees Ilasova and give Ilasova a lot of credit. I'd say it's a European play. The ball literally went to Ilasova. I don't think it stayed in his hand. No, it didn't. A, se- a second. Yeah, maybe maybe half a second. He catches and throws. And when you do that picture, the, the defense, like in football, when somebody puts a fake, a ball into the, the belly of a would-be ball carrier, and you saw all those quick defensive people, they all lean. Well, that's exactly what happened with respect to Ilasova. So when TJ gets it, he's open on the baseline. He actually could have shot it. But for him, given his skill set, he made a very intelligent play. And I would have guessed he would have gone by uh, on the baseline when he tried to drive. And Mello, uh, a bit uncharacteristically, made a terrific defensive play. He slid, got good position. And in you know, the old adage, TJ made a better offensive play. He made a little spin move, and he came out of it in the air, and he knocked down the, you know, the jumper at the buzzer. We're spending a few minutes with the coach, Jim Lynham, as he's on Sixers pre- and post-game on Comcast Sportsnet. And, uh, Jimmy, how about the role of Coach Brett Brown on not only that play, but keeping this team together with some real tough decisions that he's had to make recently with some real talented big guys? Yeah, I, that's a good point, Pete. Uh, and, really, he's kept – uh, these guys together, meaning each of these teams over the past three seasons, uh, which is no easy task, believe me, given what they faced. But particularly this year, uh, and I think he had to make this decision, uh, not that it had to be in favor of any one player or the other. I'm not suggesting that. But I don't know why the world sees it. I, I can't tell you the number of times I get asked uh, what Okafor has not played now in four straight games. And I, I like Okafor. I think he's a going to be a terrific scorer in this league. Whether it's going to be with the Sixers or not, I can't say. But people, for some reason, can't. Uh, it happened twice last night. Two, two of the young interns at uh, Comcast came in and, Coach, can he get Okafor into the game? And I say, my response, of course he can get him into the game. My question, why are you asking the question? What do you care about getting him into the game? That's not the issue. The issue is to try to develop these young guys and try to finally start winning basketball games. And in my opinion, Brett's doing the right thing. You can't filter three players through one position. If you've ever played the sport, it's, uh, you know, playing time is a huge part of one's success. And these guys are accustomed to, they take on roles. They, once they know what their roles are, then they function pretty effectively if they're good players. I think that's what you're saying now. Coach, uh, I'd like to get your opinion because when you were coaching at, at that level, these role, the, that type of player, Malone and Oakley and Barkley, and uh, there was a guy, that the, the foreman was a, a glamour position. There were some great foremen in the league. That player, a Carl Malone, where would he fit in today's game? Well, that's a good question. Um, he's still going to beat up uh, – whoever's trying to guard him from the other team. There's no question about that. The The follow-up to it is, what's he going to do at the other end if you're trying to play him, uh, you know, with a guy who can take him away from the basket? You know, he's going to be way more a perimeter player than an inside player. That's essentially what has changed with the popularity, and understandably so, of the three-point shot. You know, threes are a powerful weapon. Uh, you don't have to be a math genius to figure it out. That's why the teams now are, are shooting so many. So there'd be no change at the offensive end. And But the names that you cite, like the Barclays of the world, uh, you know, you could pick the, like the stretch fours that, that you would be enamored with, like the best. Like Draymond Green would be a good example. Plays for Golden State, you know, all-star level player, in my opinion. Part of a team that's won a championship, lost in the finals to Cleveland last year. 
that that, that that Draymond, could he guard charge Bar- Barkley? I, I would say it this way. Draymond, you're going to have your hands full, my man. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know like, like, bring it all. But but let's give Draymond his due. If I were now in the other locker room speaking to Charles, I said, Charles, you know, this guy's got a lot of game. He can do a lot of things. You know, he never stops running. He pushes the ball in the open floor. Uh, he shoots a lot of threes. So that we don't want to, you're a better player than him, Charles. But we don't want him neutralizing you because you're not ready to do what has to be done to guard this guy. Because Draymond Green is capable of getting 30 points, and therefore he would pose a problem for the guys, the type of stars that you named back in the day. Yeah, some great players uh, from that era, and uh, the era has changed a lot. Let me ask you, they've won four out of five. Um, What do you watch and say you see evolving? What is changing about this team that has allowed them to be competitive night in and night out and turn some of these games that they would have lost? They were finding ways to lose so many different games. What have you seen in recent, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks that has allowed them to pull out games like this? Yeah, I'm going to use your phrase there, Mike, to start my answer. Uh, you know, they, they literally were inventing ways to lose games. They should have had maybe five more wins, in my opinion, in the sense that they played more than well enough to win these games. But it seems like when you're trying to get over the hump, that's the type of thing that happens. I'll use last night's game for the Knicks. The Knicks have now lost nine out of ten. Are you kidding me? You cited the number. It's been 300-plus times since they lost a game like that up 10 points with two and change on the clock. But when you're struggling, that's the type of thing that happens. So I think that the Sixers, to me, it starts with Embiid, and now you have other guys whose roles are becoming more defined um, and and an infusion of talent for sure. I don't think you can uh, overstate the presence of Ilasova, what he's brought to this team. He's a a really complete all-around player. He's that, that stretch four kind of guy who can make a three-point shot. Uh, so he's been a very solidifying factor. And I think once you start experiencing some success, give Brett Brown some credit. I mean, I'm, I'm not in that locker room every day, but I can guarantee you he's been selling these guys about how they're improving. We're getting close. Yes, it's frustrating losing these types of games, but if we keep knocking on the door, it's going to happen. And, and there's no doubt that it is. And I think you're seeing now the results of that. These guys are starting to believe in themselves. I don't know if TJ could have made that play, let's say, a year ago. Uh, and I kind of got a kick. Uh, you know, people love – they love to hear somebody say something that you know, has a ring to it. They heard it on talk radio, and now they repeat it. Uh, you know, the, the number of, like, non-NBA players, supposedly, that, that populated the 76er roster. Yes, there's some truth to that over the past three years. But by the same token, it doesn't mean that every player that wore a uniform was not an NBA player. I, I'd say from the middle of last season, T.J. McConnell showed me like a quality that was going to give him a chance to have a long-term career. I'm not saying as a starter, but just be a part of a real good team because of what he brought to the table every single night. So that type of thing I think you're seeing coming to the fore much more so now. Good stuff, uh, Coach Jimmy Lineham. Don't forget to check him out on uh, Comcast pre- and post-game live as the Sixers take on the Hornets uh, tomorrow night over uh, up at the center. And, of course, you'll hear that game right here on 97.3. Coach, it was great to catch up with you. We hope we can do it again sometime soon. My pleasure, guys. Enjoy talking.